Welcome everybody to the Community Rail User Stakeholder event. Uh, Transport for North is delighted to, to see so many of you joining today. Still slightly difficult times, it's been a, a challenging year, but it, it is uh, great to be looking perhaps more optimistically uh, to the future today. We've got a, a great range of, of speakers lined up, some key players from Transport for the North themselves. We're also going to be hearing about some successful projects that uh, Community Rail Partnerships uh, around the region have been involved in. You can see that 2021 was, was, was an eventful year. I mean, not just COVID, uh, but the recovery from COVID, the change in work and travel habits. Like many others, I returned to using the trains, returned to the office. What really struck me on that first journey back into the office in Leeds was uh, the step change and the difference in the overall atmosphere. So arriving at Leeds station, I was greeted by a brand new platform that wasn't there the last time I'd commuted into Leeds. Uh, I was greeted with a much cleaner, much calmer station environment and the trains themselves were cleaner and calmer. And of course, looking around the station, um, I was able just to see mainly new or refurbished trains. No pacers, for example, that had been removed from service during the period many people weren't travelling during the pandemic. So. It feels to me like we've got a new normal and a better normal and a step change that we really need to shout about and, and sell as we get into the recovery. Uh, meanwhile, over to the Tyne Valley Community Rail Partnership and Fiona Forsyth. We were awarded first place in engaging young people in the Community Rail Awards for the project called Backtrack. We were asked by Network Rail to run a poster competition to raise awareness of trespass, particularly during the first lockdown when trespass uh, just went off the radar, grew by, by 25%, I seem to remember. Five CRPs came together from all over the country using this technology, using Zooms and Teams, and devised a competition in which we asked young people to make a video, uh, write a song, to get across the message of stay off the tracks. And our rationale was if we asked young people to make that message and share that young that message with other young people on social media, then that was going to be more effective. Last summer, summer 2021, we handed out around 5,000 stay off the track activity sheets. Now, I did try and share that, but I'm not sure whether or not that's actually on the screen at the moment. Um, standing in stations and handing them out to families and chatting to families about the importance of having that conversation with their young people that taking a shortcut across the track is just not on. So what were the benefits? Well, we certainly showcased that CRPs can work together from all over the country and create a very successful project. Um, the materials that the young people produced for us, the videos and the songs have been used with schools, even during lockdown. And it does make the young people turn their heads and look at something that was produced by one of their peers rather than a corporate organisation. Currently, we're planning Backtrack 2022. If you look at the graph to the left here, the one with the orange bars, this shows CO2 emissions per passenger kilometre for different modes. And at the bottom, the worst offender is a medium-sized car carrying just its own driver. Um, and actually, this second row down uh, reflects rail. It's an intercity train. Uh, and you can see that uh, a, the, car, uh, the, drive, the car driver emits about four times the amount of carbon than the train passenger. So we can see that rail travel and particularly electrified intercity is, is already one of the least carbon intensive ways to travel. It's emissions from our roads that account for over 95 uh, percent, and that's not including buses or coaches. So really road trips, including freight, are, are the key to tackling uh, the decarbonisation of our, our surface transport. And this chart, which uh, reflects national travel survey data analysed by Decarbonate, um, shows that, uh, and I'll get a pointer because it might be easier for me to point to these, um, that 28% of all miles travelled, so these are the orange bars in these top three rows, 28% of all miles travelled 
uh, by all modes, but but not freight, are on journeys of over 50 miles in length. And that 28% of miles comes from actually less than 2% of trips, which is reflected by the blue bars on the opposite side of the axis. Now, although percentage of miles doesn't exactly equate to percentage of emissions, it's not a bad proxy. So essentially what this graph tells us is that a really significant part of our emissions from surface transport come from very few trips, but they are the longest trips. This shows us that of the miles travelled on those trips over 50 miles in length, 60% were for leisure purposes. So what does that tell us about the opportunities for rail to help us decarbonize? Well, firstly, the biggest gains by a long way in terms of carbon emissions reductions will come from modal shift to rail rather than decarbonizing rail traction. And that's important when we look at opportunity costs. Substituting longer distance trips of 50 miles or over from road to rail rep represents a really big decarbonisation opportunity and that tackling the leisure market is key in that. Now in terms of rail we know that pre-pandemic over half of all our trips by rail on a whole UK basis were for commuting or business purposes but actually how has that profile changed? But if we are seeing a stronger leisure and weekend market comparatively what opportunities does that present for decarbonisation and how do we take full advantage of them? One of the things that strikes me is we've actually got some in the north, we've, we've got some of the best examples of what we can do with public transport. I'm not saying that's a universal picture, uh, but there, there, is, there are some very, very uh, good examples of what of what can be done. And the for me, there's a theme that, that tends to link them together and that, that it tends to go with um, devolution to, towards Chester to turn up in the morning. Uh, and in the pre-COVID world, I've got a train every seven minutes or so to, to, to take me take me in, uh, around the city. So we, we, we're blessed with a fairly frequent metro style service, but also it, 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 it delivers well uh, against the timetable. Uh, and passenger satisfaction is something we, we care about a great deal. I think there's a huge amount to be said for devolution, enabling both the, the operator who, who, who exists locally and the devolved authority, us as Mersey Travel, we know our railway well. We feel as though we know our railway well and we're able to respond uh, proactively to, to what, what, what's, what's coming and what we learn in there. The, uh, a really good example of this is, is actually the programme of work I'm responsible for, which is, which is in the round, it's half a billion pounds worth of investment. Uh, as Tony said, we've got our, our, our existing fleet of trains is now 42 years old. Um, it is quite old. It actually performs reasonably well. It's, it's, it's been well looked after over the years, has served us extremely well, but genuinely it is coming to the end of its life. Uh, and I'm responsible for, for overseeing its replacement, which is involves spending roughly £300 million on a new fleet of trains. Uh, and then a, 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 not, not quite the same level, but, but well over £150 million of investment in the infrastructure of the railway. And it's all being managed and led locally. 2021 was uh, another very busy year for us, uh, supporting the growing community rail movement, which now comprises 20 community rail partnerships and 350 station groups across the north, um, more than three and a half times that across the whole of Britain. We and our members are dealing with a, a very broad swathe of issues, but uh, within the time constraints, I'm just going to hone in on three interconnected areas, sustainability, uh, inclusive and resilient communities and, and the future of rail. So tying in with the, the themes that I know have been uh, discussed already today. So 2021 was, uh, I think, the, the year that sustainability really came to the fore in community rail uh, in, a, in a much more conscious way than, than before. But I think in the past year, we've, we've been working with our members to make these local endeavours uh, more self-aware in terms of how they impact on on the, the big global challenges that we face and 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 how they the, these activities can impact to a greater extent. So we've produced resources, we've run webinars on modal shift, sustainable development, biodiversity, 
Uh, we've bolstered our links uh, with active and sustainable travel organisations. And we've showed how Community Rail is, is uniquely positioned to be a driving force in achieving the modal shift that, that we urgently need and, and as, as has been discussed today. We even put Community Rail on the global stage at COP26 with a, an event with our third sector partners called People Make Transport. Um, but perhaps most excitingly, we saw uh, scores of Community Rail partnerships and station groups really embracing uh, the green travel message and promoting that through our first Community Rail Week in October, which included working with partners like TFN and Northern uh, to get the Go Green by train message out. But while sustainability and uh, the climate emergency have, have risen up the agenda, we've, we've continued with a, with a strong focus on social inclusion and uh, communities and their resilience and their ability to thrive, um, uh, especially as we've, we've started to really take stock of the effects of the pandemic. So we've provided regular communications and, and positive leadership across our, across our members during the, the many ups and downs of the pandemic. We've provided advice on getting in-person activities and rail promotions going again, as and when it was appropriate. And we've continually advised rail industry partners and government on the role that community rail can play in recovery and in the future, moving towards a more inclusive and accessible and welcoming transport network long term. And we've been really inspired by the way that Community Rail has uh, risen to the challenge, continued to deliver and innovate through, through COVID. Um, now, finally, I just want to give a, a brief nod, uh, but, but important nod to, to the work that's uh, going on and ramping up uh, towards a transformed railway. We are now striving to make sure that Community Rail is heard and understood through that process of change uh, and opportunities realised for the, the movement to play that uh, even stronger role in the future. And we recognise that that fundamental point about listening to communities, it's not only important to the future of rail, but the two other themes that I've talked about, uh, supporting and, and enabling a more sustainable and more inclusive uh, future for communities uh, across the North. I absolutely applaud anyone thinking about how they can make stations more accessible and, and not relying simply on technology for you know, selling more tickets. And uh, But it has to be, the, the staff will need to be trained to do so. And I, I mentioned a minimum standard across all, well, that I'd, I'd uh, re re return to that point. And I think it's not just about um, encourage, sort of using that angle in terms of encouraging young people to travel, but it's also, um, to be blunt, it's about awareness of rail as an industry and the opportunities there. I've got a three-year-old daughter. We went to see um, grandma and grandpa last weekend and we went by train at her insistence. I love the idea of an under five ticket. I think that's fantastic. I do a lot of work in the, with, with the bus industry and bus operators. Some great examples of how they very much plug into their local communities, and this is what we're talking about, but also the kind of the, the, the deals and the offers that they do. So it's more than just the bus journey. In my experience, children love travel by trains and the work Community Rail Partnerships have done with schools is, is testament to that. Firstly, thanks to TFN for, for organising this this really interesting event. I think it's been great hearing about the hearing from such a, a range of speakers. We're really pleased to see uh, Transport for the North being being bold with its uh, very strong targets and its transport decarbonisation plan. It's a topic we're going to continue to be uh, looking at this year, uh, weaving sustainability in uh, across our work, uh, including our work on, on leisure and tourism, which I know has been, been the focus in this, in this last section. Um, I've been thinking, I think, that the, the scope for us to be working more closely with organisations like Disability Rights UK, I think this conversation will pick up. We're, we're already looking closely at the results of the accessibility audit work that the DFT are undertaking and thinking about how Community Rail might be able to feed in and assist with, with improvements. We look forward to, to carrying on working with members and partners in the North to um, take the movement from, from strength to strength and continue growing that impact. So um, yeah, thanks again to TFN for today. It's been, it's been really good.